Hi, and thank you for tuning in to today's video. It has been a hot minute since the last time I came to YouTube to talk about the experience of surviving a cult, but probably like a lot of you, I have been binge watching The Vow Season 2, and it has been really freaking triggering. So I want to unpack some of the things that were said by Nexium apologists and how we as survivors of the cult of the fraud who calls himself Nithyananda can relate to the sentiment of those who are whistleblowers and survivors of Nexium and just how damaging it is psychologically to hear people excuse the reprehensible, horrific abuse of a cult just because they gain something that they consider to be good from that criminal organization. So, okay, I want to start with Nancy Salzman. Nancy Salzman was the equivalent in Nexium to what, like, the senior Acharyas would be in the cult of Nithyananda. These two cults are very, very similar in a lot of ways in that Nityananda and Keith Raniere are both malignant, narcissistic, psychopathic, sex-addicted predators, but the similarities kind of end there because Nexium was mainly developed like a self-help business, whereas the cult of Nityananda claims to be a religious organization. They claim to be a persecuted minority group reviving the ancient Hindu tradition, which for the record, does not need the likes of them to revive it. As far as I know, one billion people on the planet are practicing Hindus and they do not need a fraudulent, sex-addicted, fake Swami to revive the culture that has never actually died, so there's that. But anyway, in the Nithyananda cult, during his wickedly overpriced programs that are sometimes called Inner Awakening or Nityanandoham or Sadashivoham or Mahasada whatever 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 hum where he charges people you know $21,000 each for the last 21 day or 30 day program he himself does not teach his course content he has people teach it for him and there is a similarity there between his cult and Nexium because similarly, Keith Raniere did not teach his course content. He trained Nancy Salzman, who trained other people to teach that content for him. So I want to kind of explain that off the bat because Nityananda does have women who he uses to abuse, brainwash, punish, enforce rules, enslave, sexually assault other women. But I don't see Nancy as being Nexium's version of that. For example, in the Nityananda cult, there's people like Ranjita, who is the enforcer of his rules, and she's basically his consort, his sex partner, um, She's described, everyone has to call her Akka, which means big sister. So she's like the mother to his father figurehood within that organization. I don't really think Salzman was ever the romantic partner of Keith Raniere. If she was, that's not really depicted in the vow. But she was seen as being, in many ways, his intellectual representative. So she would speak for him. She teaches his course content. She develops his syllabus. She's like the head of the teaching division of the cult. Why I found her statements in The Vow Season 2 so triggering is that it seems that she's not able to differentiate between the role she played as his course instructor and the active participation that she played in his multiple cases of sexual abuse, abuse of power, torture of people, unlawful confinement of people, 
it's like she thinks that the end justifies the means. Like she was complaining that her company was closed because of Keith Ranieri's private life. And lady, that's not the case. Your company was a front for Keith Ranieri's abuse of people. It's like she doesn't get it that she was a co-cult leader. So there were a few things that she said specifically that I find really triggering, really problematic, and really telling of the fact that she actually is criminally guilty. And those are, in the first episode, I think, of season two, she plays a voicemail that the brave, badass whistleblower Sarah Edmondson left for her, where Sarah Edmondson is obviously distraught and going through all kinds of emotion because of her horrific branding. And Sarah says to her something like, wake the fuck up. And, you know, asks her rightfully why she didn't bother to reach out to Sarah when Sarah went public. And Nancy plays that message acting like she's the victim in it, acting like she was verbally assaulted or something by this voicemail without giving the context that Sarah Edmondson had worked her way up in that organization, had become a teacher, had become a recruiter, was doing a lot of good as far as within the cult dynamic and cult belief, she was doing good as far as bringing people in, training them, making them good, obedient Nexium members. She had such a valid point that when she was horrifically abused in the DOS slave master sex cult branch of Nexium, you would think that if you had been horrifically abused by one branch of an organization, the lady who is sitting at the head of the organization will call you up and say, what's up? What happened? Are you okay? Why did you leave like that? Tell me your side of the story. So Sarah left this voice message for Nancy, just like anybody would. For example, if you have a job in an office and you get hired by a person in the PR team, or you know, you get hired by the head of your department, who in this case would be like Nancy, and then somebody from another department calls you into a dark room, takes collateral of you, insists that, you know, you have to give us something on you to prove your loyalty. But don't worry, all the top members of the company have done it, so just give us a nude photo or say something humiliating against your husband that's not true. And we'll never use it, but this way we know we can trust you. Say you do that, you go along with it, and then... They force you to get tattoo of the name of the CEO of the company on your private parts. Like you would be angry and you would go public, right? If you're brave, like Sarah is. And if you do, you would kind of expect that the PR person who hired you in the first place would reach out to apologize if they're a decent, level-headed, good-hearted human being or at the very least to ask you, is this true? If they just have basic human curiosity. So I feel like Nancy Salzman is so tone deaf and blinded by her own narcissistic traits that she cannot even understand why Sarah Edmondson was rightfully pissed and why I feel like that voice message was much less than it could have been. She also described Nippy, Sarah Edmondson's husband, as throwing a, quote, tantrum when he started calling up other members of Nexium and telling them, hey, my wife got branded and that's wrong. So the absolute craziest thing Nancy Salzman said in that episode is that she is more angry at Sarah Edmondson than she is at Keith Ranieri. Now this is the equivalent of a Hollywood actor saying they are more angry at the Me Too movement whistleblowers than they are at Harvey Weinstein. Why? 
because Miramax collapsed. This would be like if a Miramax employee was butthurt that Miramax got canceled because the boss was a perverse, abusive, rapist pig, that they're more mad at the women who spoke out than they are at the abuser who brutalized those women through horrific sexual abuse. So Nancy Salzman, it's like, the reason I find it so aggravating is that it seems like she thinks that she's duping the audience into believing that she's innocent. She's trying to make it sound as if she's got plausible deniability, like, oh, I didn't know Keith Raniere was up to these things. I didn't know that he abused my daughter like this. I didn't know that he had locked that poor girl up in a room for three years. If I had known that, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, after being sentenced, after being convicted, after pleading guilty, even after realizing she's got to go down with this ship because the ship's going down, even still, after all the time she's had to introspect and self-reflect, she still told the crew of The Vow in season two, so like there's already a season out that she could have watched and familiarized herself with and read the fucking room. She still thinks that she will come off looking good by saying that she's more angry at the victim than she is at the perpetrator. And I think her entire persona is summed up by that. Now, they also had this guy in The Vow season two who had Tourette syndrome and the NLP and the training and the one-on-one the -on -one work with Nancy Salzman helped him get a handle on his, on his tics and he's able to speak fluently now and he attributes that fluency to Nexium. And he very dangerously excuses the abuse that Keith did to women, the abuse that that cult did, the financial exploitation against members, the litigation antagonization, the way they abuse the judiciary to attack whistleblowers. Like, my God, people, have you ever looked into Tony Natale's case and the way Keith Ranieri stalked her, maliciously took out suits against her, had the FBI investigate her because she tried blowing the whistle on this, like, decades ago? This guy is excusing all of that criminal behavior because of his one personal experience getting his Tourette's under control. Now, what I want to say about this is that the exact same thing is happening with members of the cult of the fraud who calls himself Nithyananda. There are people in his cult who have benefited from the yoga routine. Nityananda did not invent that yoga, just like Keith Raniere did not invent NLP. So if Nancy Salzman was able to have breakthroughs with these individuals who have Tourette's syndrome, it is not because Keith Raniere is the world's most intelligent man, as he claimed. Just like if people benefit from Nityananda yoga, it's not because Nithi is the reviver of the ancient mystic tradition of Kundalini Raju or Shiva Stamba yoga. It is teams of people working behind the scenes to feed that information to the so-called Acharyas or to the, so to the Nancy Salzmans of these organizations. You can be benefited by one of the things a cult does as part of its blanket net recruitment effort without enabling the abuse that goes on in the cult behind the scenes. So... What I feel about this, this guy who has gotten his Tourette's under control, he actually says in the interview that people have asked him, why doesn't he just continue the work, but cut his ties with Keith Raniere and cut his ties with Nancy Salzman? And I think he hasn't allowed himself to recognize that he is allowed to feel what he feels as far as the gratitude for the work that he did with them. But he's also allowed to recognize that they are horrific abusers. This is something that 
I think a lot of us need to understand when it comes to the dynamics of relationships with people who have different layers to their personalities. Somebody could be, for example, a loving father, but an abusive husband. And the child might feel really conflicted and torn because that child loves their father, but they also hate seeing the father abuse their mother. And I think that the way cults operate, the way cult members feel a loyalty to the leader, it doesn't allow for any gray area. It doesn't allow for somebody to say, what you did to me was good, but what you're doing to others is bad and I don't support it. Cults make people feel like the leader did this good thing for you, therefore you owe the leader your life, you owe the leader your infinite gratitude, you owe the leader solidarity, you owe that leader your life. And so you see individuals like this guy who has gotten a handle on his Tourette's but now he's willing to excuse the branding, the, the way that Keith duped these poor women into giving him collateral and then becoming essentially his property. There are apologists. There's a, a young woman who's one of the members of DOS who's excusing the actions of DOS because she is still brainwashed by DOS. And where I think this becomes really dangerous is that victims who have not yet come forward in cults like Nexium or cults like the one that I've exposed being part of, and by the way, it's a group effort. Like originally, for the record, Nityananda cult was exposed by a very, very brave woman named Arti Rao, who was his first public rape victim to talk to the media in India. She's done extensive efforts to dissuade other people from falling into that trap. A brave whistleblower named Lenin Karupan, who took the footage of Nityananda with Ranjita, who is his number two in the cult. They're basically the male and the female leader of that cult. Ranjita is not a victim. She is a co-criminal along with Nityananda who strategizes their attacks against whistleblowers. She's in charge of punishing people who fall out of line with his instructions. She, she is the head of his mafia wing, to put it lightly. Anyway, we have a very similar dynamic in the cult of Nityananda where people they might know that some of the abuse is true. They know that children got beaten in the Gurukul. They know that Maud Vait beat kids. They know Maud Vait forced kids to beat other kids. She has admitted so to other people within the cult. And yet they excuse it because they've benefited from the yoga or they felt a state of oneness or higher consciousness in the meditations or they've experience some kind of a breakthrough in their career or in their personal life. And here's where I think people need to understand that just because a person does one good thing doesn't mean that all the bad things they do are okay. And I mean, we get that as ordinary people who are not brainwashed. Ordinary being a good thing here as like, full functioning self-sovereign human beings who are not surrendered to a narcissistic cult leader, we get that humans are nuanced, that you're capable of doing good or bad, and that the good things you do don't excuse the bad things you do. But in a cult, people have been forced to let go of their critical thinking skills and to ignore their intuition and to ignore the red flags and to justify all of the abuses. So I think it's really unfortunate that a platform is being given to people like Nancy Salzman and like that Tourette's, um, I don't know whether to call him like a recovered, I, I don't know the terminology for that, but this man who has, you know, overcome his Tourette's triggers, I think it's good that he overcame Tourette's, but I think it's bad that he's using that personal gain 
in order to excuse the damage that has been done to so many people's lives. And I feel like the takeaway here, when a victim goes public about the abuse that they've suffered, it's not like a regular world scenario. For example, if a woman gets date raped or if a woman gets, you know, sexually harassed by her boss and she speaks out, there's that common phrase, it's her word against his. It's like, if nobody was there to witness it, if you don't have direct evidence, it's your word against his. But when the abuse took place in a cult, it's not your word against his, it's your word against his entire community. And this is not a community who strives for truth. This is a community who strives for approval of the leader. And when you have a narcissistic psychopath like Keith Raniere or like Nityananda, that approval is only given by the leader if you do and say exactly what he wants you to do and say. He will never bless somebody to speak their truth if their truth contradicts the lie that he's trying to get away with. And so when you hear people excusing the behavior of Keith Raniere, justifying the behavior of Keith Raniere, oh my God, his lawyer, that lawyer, when in the most recent episode, when that brave young woman, Daniela, talks about how she was psychologically held as a prisoner in a room for years because Keith Raniere couldn't handle the ego blow of the fact that she made out with a guy her own age and had an actual romance start to develop. When his sleazy lawyer said afterwards, it's not a crime to hurt somebody. We all hurt people in our relationships all the time. And yes, this is a different lifestyle than most people live, but it's not a crime. Can I just say it's about fucking time that coercive control becomes a criminal offense? Because if it's not illegal, it damn well should be. People who enslave other people through systematic abuse that includes sleep deprivation, that includes hypnotic techniques to make people align to what they're being told to do, that includes the fear of public shunnings and turning their families against them, the way Daniela's entire family had sided with Keith Raniere against her because they all took him to be their guru. When somebody's life is being entirely controlled by another human being, and then that human being deliberately hurts them because they are not obedient to his command, that should be a crime. And that's something that sadly I see in the lives of people who are still members of the cult of the fraud who calls himself Nityananda. There are women being trafficked all over the world right now as so-called ambassadors for his fake made-up nation of Kailasa. And they've been charged with the mission to make connections and diplomatic relations with other nations in order to try to bring you know, legitimacy or some kind of credence to his fake country that he's claiming to have made up. So these people are not acting as free agents. They are not traveling of their own free will to dangerous countries in the world, meeting with foreign governments, trying to establish diplomatic relations. They are being trafficked. They are being coercively controlled. They are living with the fear that if they don't do what they are told to do, they will be shunned by the community that they have come to believe is the only thing that matters in the entire world right now. And I find it really unfortunate to see that even after all the media exposure Nexium has had, all the bravery people like Sarah Edmondson, Tony Natale, Susan Dones, all the other whistleblowers who have come forward, even after all of that, there are still people who believe it's okay what Keith did. And sleazy lawyers like his 
can pretend to be okay with the crimes he committed and can pretend that it's not illegal to do what he's done to people. So I feel like as a community of survivors, those of us who survived the cult of Nityananda, and shout out to anybody watching this video who comes from that cult and you got the guts to start listening to what I have to say, despite the fact that your leader told you, I'm going to lead you to whatever demon lair he claims I come from. Um, if you're watching this and wondering what can we do or what should we do, I think what we need to do as a community of survivors is take a page from the playbook of the Nexium whistleblowers and not be afraid to speak up. And so I know I said just a minute ago, when you are abused by a cult, it's not your word against the leaders, it's your word against the entire community. In the past, that created a power dynamic by which the abused victim is set up to fail, is set up to lose, because this community does use the judiciary as a weapon against those who can't afford adequate legal representation. So the way Keith Ranieri used to sue anybody who spoke out against Nexium and would antagonized through courts using the millions of dollars the Bronfman sisters fed to him. Nityananda has done similar things. He hit Arti Rao with over $500,000 worth of fees, court fees, after suing her in multiple different cities in the United States when she came forward about the fact that he raped her. He attacked Lenin Karupan in India with false rape cases. He tried to attack me with a false rape case. He tried to, well, he did do a character assassination against me by having people falsely accuse me of crimes like rape and keeping a sex slave, being a CIA agent sent to assassinate him with a poisoned chocolate bar. Like he has accused me of ridiculous things that I obviously didn't do. In the past, that would have been terrifying. In 10 years ago, for example, when he did things like this to Arti Rao, the world didn't understand what a cult's retaliatory case against a victim looked like. But today, in 2022, thanks to badass brave people like Leah Remini and like Sarah Edmondson, we have a grounds for comparison. We see the way Scientology antagonizes whistleblowers. One of the first people who spoke to me publicly after I came out against Nityananda was the late great Ron Miscavige. He is the father of David Miscavige, who heads up Scientology. And his wife had reached out to me on YouTube and said, Ron, does videos, he interviews other cult survivors, he mainly talks about Scientology, but there seem to be some similarities between Scientology and this cult you've left. So I was invited to three interviews on Ron's channel. And before I gave those interviews, I had, you know, a Skype call with Ron, he talked to me, he was very, very sweet, he had kind of a grandfatherly vibe. I sent him an email when the cult started its character attacks against me and said, maybe you might want to avoid interviewing me because they're calling me a rapist. They're accusing me of assassination attempt. They've accused my friends of drug trafficking. And I think if you interview me, they're probably going to attack you also. And he gave me the best answer to that anybody could have given me. And it's one of the things that has been a strength for me throughout all of those false accusations. He said, they are attacking you with lies because they are so afraid of the truth that you're speaking. And he told me he wanted to interview me even more because of all that shit they were saying. And then he sent me links to websites that Scientology had created falsely accusing him of all kinds of crimes. And he said, 
it's called fair game. That was the first time I heard that technical term, fair game, which now, thanks to Leah Remini, I think all of us are familiar with. What I want to say is, if you are a survivor of cult abuse, and you are scared to speak out because you don't want the entire community you dedicated your life to harassing you, threatening you, creating false stories against you, attacking you through litigation, attacking you through social media, understand that 10 years ago, that would have been a possibly life-destroying thing to suffer. But in today's world, because we see physically on HBO or on Discovery Plus and on all kinds of different platforms, A&E, we see that the cult survivors are right to speak out about the cult abuse. Weinstein is in prison. Epstein died in prison. Keith Ranieri is rotting away with four consecutive life sentences. Nityananda's days are numbered. It's going to happen to him too. How fast it happens, I feel, depends on how many of us have the guts to speak out and how quickly we do it. So if you are a survivor of the cult of Nityananda, you know where to reach me already. You know where to find me on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. I'm not saying that you have to give your name and go public immediately. I could put you in touch with journalists who can protect your identity. But I think we need to get the ball rolling here before more people are abused, before more people start getting trafficked to dangerous places, before it turns into my worst nightmare, which would be another Heaven's Gate or Jonestown type scenario. Nityananda has already tried to make his brainwashed followers okay with the idea of dying for him. Let's not see him actually enact that horrific possibility. So anyway, that's, that's my little reaction to up to the fifth episode of The Vow Season 2. Let me know in a comment how it makes you feel when you hear people like Nancy Salzman crying that she lost her company even though her company was a front for a cult. Um, how do you feel about this man whose Tourette's was, you know, brought under control? I do think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm happy for him that he was able to get relief from his tics. But I am really sadly disappointed that he's not able to see that the one good thing that happened in his life does not justify the abuse of women being perpetrated by the person he credits with that one good thing that happened to him. Nityananda may have given you a yogic body because he introduced you to Nityananda yoga. That does not mean you owe him your life, your lifelong gratitude, or that you should shame, harass, malign, lie about, character assassinate, or threaten death upon those who he has hurt, who are speaking out against him. I know we get this because you're watching this video, but I hope those words will reach the people who need to hear them. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. I'll try not to let it go as long before my next video about this. If you have any questions about the cult, feel free to leave them in a comment below. If you're a survivor and you want me to interview about it, let me know. Let's see. We might be able to talk. Thanks for watching. Stay self-sovereign. Don't trust anybody who tells you to trust them no matter what anybody else says about them. And we'll see you next time.